Good uh, evening, everybody. This is um, uh, Changing Places One, Changing Places and Changing Identities. I'm Luke Bennett, uh, and uh, this is a shoe, space and place uh, group event. And for those of you with um, good attention to detail, I call it shoe, space and place group because it's been around for about a decade. And we're not on brand yet with the, uh, the idea of calling it the Hallam Space and Place Group. Eventually, somebody will track me down and force me to make that change. But I haven't made that change uh, just yet. Uh, you're all very welcome. Uh, the nature of these uh, sessions is um, informal, uh, but I should uh, just emphasize that we are recording uh, most of this session for uh, the benefit of people who can't be here today. Uh, and in order to um, upload the the raw recording, uh, we don't do editing, it's just the raw recording uh, to um, our YouTube site, which has a roster now of how many is that? Seven, seven previous events uh, from the COVID era uh, since we became disembodied and moved online. Uh, one of the positives of that is being able to record our sessions. Um, so the Sheffield Hallam University Space and Place Group is um, a very loose, very loose. Uh, confederation of researchers across the institution and beyond interested in exploring the different ways that uh, the nature of places and the experience of space uh, can be uh, researched uh, for various purposes and in various ways. What we've tended to do in recent years is pick um, an annual theme and then come at that theme from a number of different angles uh, over uh, over a number of sessions uh, spread across that year. Last year, for example, we had four sessions looking at the notion of haunts and haunting, so the, the placial aspect, if you like, of, um, of, of hauntedness. Um, and as you can see from um, the screen there, we chose various angles to, to come at it and had some guest speakers and also many home speakers um, to, to talk about the topic. Uh, this year, uh, we are looking at the theme of changing places um, and for reasons that are rather long winded, uh, but are also not important. Ultimately, uh, we've become slightly bifurcated. We've got two strands working in parallel that are both fundamentally about changing places. It's just that because we've teamed up with the higher education um, research cluster um, at Hallam, um, we've already had two events under the Changing Campus um, uh, title, and we've got a third one coming along in May. Uh, and then today's event is the first <clears throat> in a series of three, possibly more, spread across the remainder of 2022, uh, that are looking at non-campus um, place change uh, uh, concepts and, and, and angles. Um, so. The event for today, uh, no, actually the event for next time, before I tell you about the event for today, uh, it made sense when I put it together in this order. Um, the next event in the Changing Places series is looking at, as it says there, change and the material fate of place. So the, the, the operative part there really is the idea that um, places materially change. So that's very much about the non the non-human element within the notion of changing places. And we've got three presenters who are going to present um, in that session on that theme. The reason why I put the description of the second session first is in order to be able to then say, and today's session is about turning that the other way around. So it'd be perhaps more conventional to be looking at how places change, but I actually want us to be looking today, and we are gonna be looking today at how perhaps places help change people, which is a less common way around um, of looking at it. And that got me thinking about popular daytime and afternoon and evening television. Uh, and I'd misremembered the title of the programme, Changing Rooms as Changing Places. So when I went to look for um, a copy of the title slides to that 1990s home renovation um, programme, I was rather disappointed to find that it was called Changing Rooms, not Changing Places. But anyway, I stuck with it and I thought, OK, still fits in with our theme because the whole premise of that programme was that you would get neighbours to swap houses temporarily and the neighbours from house A would renovate or redecorate a room in house B 
in a way that they either thought their neighbours who owned House B would love or would hate. So the whole idea of the programme was that these sort of competitive house invading redecorators would deliver some kind of provocation or effect upon their neighbours, that their neighbours would either come to have a nicer sense of enjoying their house or occasionally would have that sense of enjoying their house unsettled and disturbed. And the whole programme involved all sorts of embodied assumptions made by the neighbours who'd come into the house to change that room about who they thought the homeowners actually were or should be and how by rearranging the room they could somehow transform or provoke uh, their neighbours to be slightly better versions of themselves or different versions of themselves. So that I suppose is a primitive version of place changing people uh, but very much working within the domain of sort of refurbishment or, or what have you. Um, but I want to take it even further. Uh, and so I've got a short um, video clip that I'm going to play. And this is all by way of warm up to the important speakers today. I'm not the important speaker. But indulge me. Uh, I'm going to play you a four and a half minute clip from an episode of the TV show, Mr. Ben, right? It's really important. This is really going to sort of set us in the right in the right frame. Some of you are far too young to remember Mr. Ben, but he was a very important part of my 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 growing up. So there we are. So here we go. Can you hear the sound? Yes, good. Yeah. Hello. Saturday morning in Festive Road. Coal was being delivered and boys were playing with wooden swords. Everything was very ordinary. This is an ordinary street. At number 52, the postman arrived with a letter. Number 52 is Mr. Ben's house. And Mr. Ben was at the front door to meet the postman. The letter was an invitation to a fancy dress party. Mr. Ben wasn't really very fond of parties, but he did like fancy dress. He put his hat and coat out to search the shops for something special to wear. He tried the big shops. So big shops. Still, he didn't find anything. He tried the small shops and the side streets. Everywhere, it was the same story. No fancy dress, only ordinary, everyday clothes. But at last, in a back lane, he found a little shop with all sorts of interesting things to wear. In the window was a suit of bright red armour. Mr. Ben went into the shop. As if by magic, the shopkeeper appeared. Can I help you, sir? he asked. After looking quickly round the shop, Mr. Ben said, I wonder if I might borrow that suit of red armour. The man seemed pleased. Of course, he said. Would you like to see if it fits? And he pointed to the door of the fitting room. Mr. Ben carried the armour through the door and found he was in a small room. Quickly, he changed into the armour. He smiled at the red knight reflected in the mirror. He laughed.
then he noticed another door. Well, said Mr. Ben, and he walked through the second doorway. Instead of another room, Mr. Ben found himself in rocky countryside. From behind a large pile of rocks, he could see smoke rising. Feeling brave in his red armor, he walked over to see what was making the smoke. He climbed the rocks and found the smoke was coming from a dragon, quite a large dragon. Gosh, thought Mr. Ben, somebody else in fancy dress. And he Right, now then, I've got to link this into the erudite papers that are now going to follow this presentation, and I'm now going to do that with this slide. We're concerned today with how places may have a role, well, places and the things that are found in them may have a role in changing people, whether they want to be changed or not. Maybe one of the things that we're all going to be embracing as a should have shared principle, although it's open to challenge if anyone wants to challenge it, is that we live in an era in which the multiplicity of identity is you know, implicitly acknowledged. So if there are places like changing rooms that have the ability to trigger some kind of transformation or invitation of people to take on temporarily or permanently new identities, we have to ask ourselves, what are the mechanisms, the physical mechanisms of room arrangement, place deportment, that operate that switching, that enable that switching, what are the, the codes by which this interaction between place and people um, is occurring. Mr. Ben is trying to escape from an environment in which is described as ordinary, and ordinary is emphasised. He goes to this strange backwater shop, dons a red armour suit, and suddenly acquires newfound confidence and goes off to a new place in which he can have wonderful um, adventures. Props, therefore, not just places, but the props that are to be found within those places, enable the alteration of identity or force the alteration of identity and character. I think those are the kind of themes that connect the papers that we're going to have today, but I'm going to stop trying to trying to join it all together now and I'm just going to launch uh, into the actual um, session with uh, much gratitude and gratefulness to uh, our assembled speakers um, who I'm going to invite to introduce themselves because they know themselves much better than I do uh, and that always seems the most appropriate way to run these uh, run these sessions and maintain the sense of informality and sharing. So we're going to take the speakers in the order that they are uh, listed there for no reason other than that we need an order and that's what the order is. Um, so uh, I'm going to stop uh, sharing my screen and I'm going to invite um, Nantia to introduce herself uh, and uh, get us uh, fully underway. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. Um, so that's right. So my name is Nadia. Um, so NT in Greek, it sounds D. I I'm only saying that because Greece uh, connection places home belonging has long been um, a research interest, but also something that is very personal to me. Um, I did, um, uh, I moved to Sheffield two years ago and now I'm um, I'm leading the court, the BA in jewellery materials and design. So I have a background in architecture. So I'm basically more design, art design and architecture. And I'm coming from um, a research background into lecturing and educating new researchers, yeah. Maybe should I say a few more, like I'm, I'm also interested around technology, digital making and how, how digital uh, sort of ways of connectivity through digital technology can inform jewellery practices um, and help us, uh, well, hopefully find new connections to our sense of self, belonging, home and um, all these lovely issues. I'm very interested. Thank you. If you'd like to share your screen, you the screen. Oh, sorry. Up. I thought we were going to introduce each other before. Oh, I... no, no, no. Well, sorry. Oh, sorry. Apologies. First intern. <laughs> uh, so that was, uh, of course, I will. Yeah. Um,
Okay, so I mostly said um, the first page of, um, of my slides. Um, and uh, I'm, uh, so I was trying to link sort of the theme around place, location, um, and my work around design. So um, bear with me, it's quite informal and it's the first time I'm, I'm sharing this presentation. So not the work, but the, the actually the way of presenting. Um, so, uh, so this work has started when I did my PhD a couple of years ago. And um, as I said, it's, it's quite a lot is autobiographical. And I have long been wondering what it means to belong and what it means to not being neither here nor there, feeling not Greek, traveled and lived in a lot of European countries. And I think this quote from uh, Derrida captured quite well um, that maybe I belong in parts, maybe I don't belong at all, uh, or maybe I try to belong, but I'm always a foreign. So I think it's quite, um, so it captures really well that being a, a part of a culture, uh, it doesn't always need to be fully part of it. So I can be comfortable with being a stranger. Um, but that's uh, over the years has not been very easy. Um, so this is a piece of my, um, uh, well, I guess work of digital jewelry. And I'm going to just explain to you a little bit what digital jewelry is. Um, so uh, pieces of wearable, um, sort of container, small objects, could be wearable, could not be wearable uh, necessarily, but they are objects with very, very strong personal meaning and connection to who we are. Um, so this piece, um, when we are on a flight, there is a sensor within the piece that senses the altitude. So after the takeoff, um, when the aeroplane is on a cruising mode, there is an LED within the piece that lights up and allows the wearer or the owner in this case to view a film. So something, a message that is very personal to the person only during the flight. Uh, the reason why that I'll explain to you why the planes have been interesting to me as a place um, where I start developing this work around digital jewelry is because I've been looking around home and home of origin and transition, the physical transition between places. Um, and I found out through the research that the plane is a liminal space between those locations, that there is time to connect, reconsider, rediscover our sense of self and create that bum bubble of personal, um, uh, of a personal object that you're gonna draw into it. And um, this is me a couple of years ago, it's in 2008, where I took, I took the piece um, on the plane, a number of planes, uh, journeys, um, and sort of I reflected um, on how I felt. And on the right side of the slide, you can see what is a microfilm. So it's a tiny photograph, um, sort of in a tiny scale that I can enclose within the piece. So the specificity in those pieces and quite a poetic um, sort of use of digital technology. Um, so this is what I call artistic digital jewellery, which is within this category of smart wearables and maybe, you know, the Fitbits and smart watches, but definitely takes more of an artistic and personal approach. So I've been long wondering until today, um, so what's the potential of digital jewellery and art digital jewellery to support the liminal se sense of self? And as I said, home belonging and not belonging has been a key theme. Um, so I've been wondering what is our relationship to our home of origin when we live abroad? What does it feel to live and be in between places, cultures and centers of self? What does it feel to be a foreign, to be a stranger at home, but also to belong nowhere or belong in parts? So what does it feel to be a foreign? So these have been all questions that sort of instigate uh, my research and I'm not alone. I'm not alone in this, there is a lot, there's mobility within Europe, within the world and um, usually from low income countries or from the south to the north, I'm not gonna go too much into that, but it's quite interesting to see statistics and what is important is mobility is growing as well. Um, so there are more and more people moving uh, from one country to the other. And this is quite interesting that is in Europe has the largest globally sort of 
but it's not a country, but um, an area in the world where we have 45 million migrants in 2020. And it's only estimated that it's growing. So I'm, I've just been long wondering what, what does it mean for a lot of people? That's not just me. Um, so that initiated sort of my work around uh, working with other um, participants at the time to try to understand the context of home, what it feels to mean to be in between, what's the impact to the self and how can design, how can I materialize those feelings of what I call nowadays of trying to think of foreignness and otherness of not, not, not actually um, having one sense of self or maybe a more dynamic one. Um, what is interesting to me, as I said, is I, I took a quite of informal way of presenting the work because initially seven, ten years ago, when I left Greece, home for me was something around stability, permanence, you want fixed around a place and location, which was Greece. It, I was rooted in that place. I had the sense of place and sense of self around community, around family and belonging. So relocation for me, it is about mobility, fluidity and freedom and new opportunities, but it was something about losing who I was and who I am. Uh, so there was a loss of place. I had to have this mobility, ability to adapt. There was this crossing of cultures, displacement and rootedness. So there's a little bit of a, a bad connotation, a bit of negative feelings around relocation. So usually uh, my sense of self, and still today, it is about, it is a question, it's liminal, it's a lot about rediscovery, and sometimes it's about imagining this country of home that never exists. So it's kind of become stays in my imagination. So through a process of working with two, uh, three other participants in qualitative ways, so very much in depth process of two years of working with them, um, I came to understand that that transition between places of home is not always the same. Um, so it's different every time. There's this temporal and special dynamics. Um, there's a routine and practicalities of traveling, but I start realizing that the notion of travel between two places was quite interesting. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit of the methods that because design often, I think when we're not in design research, we don't think of design as a way of understanding people's and experiences. Whereas the thing I think is quite important, a big part of my practice. So I use performance. I run a workshop around, um, well, a plane and I was a stewardess and then I was having um, a lot of questions around sense of self and around home and belonging. And it was interesting to find a lot of things around the plane as a space where we can reinvent ourselves, recover from one culture to get ready to adapt to another. It's a time where we actually spend time with ourselves. We're feeling getting lost. Um, and that's the reason why I wanted to connect with the first piece I'll show you where that inspiration came from. This is a number of design probes I've used within this process to try to understand what it means and feels in between there was a compass when I've asked participants to point where home is for them. Um, there is um, a cushion, sort of, um, um, what do you call this, uh, the, the mask, where I so say, what does it feel to be in transition? So I've used design as a way to ask questions and open up sort of participants' feelings. Um, and then I started realizing that maybe sense of self is not something that is, um, something I lose, but is this idea of being constantly liminal and being constantly comfortable with change. So that dynamic element of rediscovery starting to empowering me a little bit more, not just me and also the participants, of belonging in between, not belonging to one place or to the other, or maybe belonging in parts. So maybe thinking that home is a feeling, is a sense of motion, is a sense of familiarity and safety. Uh, I'm just going to very briefly show you just to see the images of the, the results of, of that work around jewellery and around technology. I'm not going to go, I mean, maybe we have time in the discussion, but I focus more, much more about sort of the concept and the idea of designing objects um, for that liminal self. 
Moving on to um, when I moved to Sheffield from Newcastle, where I spent the last six years before I moved to Sheffield, it was a lot about confinement. So I used I used to be very mobile, able to go to Germany, to Denmark, to UK, and sort of questioning myself and who I was. But it was um, I faced the different fears when it was I was really strict to say in one location. And then I started thinking, so what could be the role of design and more particularly that the, the role of art jewellery to support myself during that transition? Um, so this is still a work in progress, but I'll show you. Um, oops, I'm almost done there. Uh, this is the two more slides. So um, I used to live in Newcastle uh, for five years, as I said, whereas the, um, the tide in Newcastle was quite dramatic for me. Coming from a Mediterranean Sea, we don't have low tides and high tides in, in within a day. So there was a, a natural element, I guess, that was a phenomenon that was quite inspiring. Um, so what I did, um, thinking about the sea and the atmosphere of the sea, and how important for me it is as being Greek. Um, I've designed a piece with the help of a software developer where we link data from the tide range. So when the tide is low and the tide is high and that maps it into light. Um, the piece on the right is where I am at the moment in terms of the design. But when the tide is low, uh, you will see at this, at this the, final piece, the final slide, there is an LED that lights up. So it goes from blue to green to yellow, from blue to green to yellow. And it's just, it was just a way for me to stay connected with the sea. So I know it's quite poetic, it's quite abstract, but in a way what helped me to do is I start writing a lot about my feelings. Um, I started drawing um, the sea, my feet in the water. So it was something interesting to start thinking about jewellery as atmospheres, as ways of opening up that sort of window around um, a, comfort, a comfortable space, maybe like Mr. Ben. So it's like an imaginary space where I, I started feeling more comfortable. Um, so I'm going to close with some thoughts and maybe it would be good to hear what do you think that... Um, um, I have been sort of thinking that I know I'm, I'm a, I, I grew up in Greece. I've lived and left Greece when I was 25. Um, I don't think I'm going to go back um, at, at any point. We, you never know. Um, but there is a lot of people that actually have keep traveling from being children to adults. And there is this, I, I might, be, you might be familiar with that, the, the uh, third culture kids that actually they don't feel they have a home like a fixed home a fixed place um which i find quite sort of interesting as a as a concept and as a situation to try and to understand what is the this modern nomadic way of living when you actually never had a fixed definition of home and if and how can we materialize those feelings of home when we're constantly in transition and what would be that role of otherness in developing of jewellery for the nomadic living? So I'm going to close um, with those questions that could be questions for me. And um, I don't know if it was too confusing for the audience because I'm not familiar. At, um, I'm not used to not, um, I guess, not have designers on the other side. So I was trying to do my best to bring a bit more context around the work. So. Well, I, I, I thank you very much. I think you, uh, I think you performed that that lovely. I've got a, a much richer sense of how design can be research. Um, it, not not design can be research, but you you had some wonderful phrases in there. Design probes, mm -hmm. like the little artifacts, can somehow provoke situation, and then you mm -hmm. can analyze what 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 that artifact is is bringing out of that situation. And I love that phrase um, that you put up on that final slide as a question. How can we materialize feelings of home? Because it seems mm. to me that, that essentially is what you're trying to do, working with that classical sense of jewelry of you know, this can be a precious embodiment of something, a totem of of, of care and consideration. I, I'm intrigued to know you, you showed us the micro microcosmos. Micro um, and, and you sort of gave us a glimpse of a sort of small picture, but I couldn't mm. quite remember what the picture was. So so what is the the feeling? 
feeling slash memory that you're trying to materialize materialize within that within that device you've got that link to the c and the other device mm -hmm. wondering what was it that was, in was it that was supposed to reveal itself uh -huh. at a certain altitude as you're flying away from home towards some other temporary home that's right. So it, it was a text that uh, my mother have sent me uh, via an email when I was um, struggling writing my thesis, I guess. So it was just um, a text in Greek, like a little poem written from my mum, which is um, a tiny, tiny, you cannot really read it with um, your, your eyes. You need a magnifying glass. And I think that sort of a way of exploring, looking through something that it always makes me maybe takes away um, my head and then no, it takes away, what does it takes away? It just takes away maybe the frustration for a second. Say, oh, my mom would say this. I should be doing this now. There's a little bit of that um, taking out of me, looking within me, outside me. I think there's just a text um, that comforts me. And I know for some people, it, they will never have that and they don't have the need for that. But for some Others like myself, this brings quite a comfort um, to look within, to self-reflect, to make sure that it's okay not to feel okay, and it's okay to just feel that um, going back home is not easy, and it's getting harder and harder. Mm. Um, so that is very much of a personal piece, but the. I guess what design or my digital jewellery practice aims to do is to say, oh, I could imagine that being a piece of jewellery that has a meaningful text for you and a potting text that is something meaningful to you. Mm. Um, but it's that anticipation as well. So you never know when the piece will start working. So it has that element of um, looking, you start having that connection with the device and through that to yourself, because you kind of know what the text is. But the fact that it's a surprise and an exploration, it creates that sort of um, more bit, maybe more of a self-reflective space. That's all what it is, isn't it? Mm. I, I don't, don't take this the wrong way because it's not meant flippantly, but I'm thinking of Tamagotchis. You've made a sort of reverse yeah. Tamagotchi, which, which is looking after you rather than you looking after it. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there are no easy answers, and I think that I not think there will ever be. But um, as I said, the, the the other piece, which is connection to the sea. When I made the piece, I never thought that I will I will start writing down my thoughts. So it will be just a provocation for me to just write down how I experience lockdown and how much I struggle with what's going on. So uh, in that way, it was a little bit more like an art therapy piece. Um, and it doesn't always work. It's not that every day this piece will actually create that comfort. But that's exactly what jewellery do, in my opinion. It's just, um, it gives you that connection when you want it, um, if you want it. Because yeah. I suppose things like lockets have this sort of eternal charge and it's always there. It's not battery dependent, whereas mm -hmm. what you've invented has this sort of jeopardy built into it that the, the power might dissipate. And, and, and somehow the correct. charge is lost because it's not entirely inherent, but... Uh, it is correct, it's correct, it's correct. Those are the challenges of technology, but I have long, I long been thinking that um, technology is another material and nowadays we just interact more than ever. So why don't we try to think alternative ways to interact with it? But you're very right. The battery will stop working. Uh, you need to charge those devices. Um, these are prototypes that are not as sophisticated as a smartwatch is. Mm. Um, but it's a quite of an interesting space for me to explore. Yeah. But you have to recharge your memories as well. You have to re-remember things. So it's not entirely different. Anyway, I'm hogging this. So I, I need to sort of, I need to shut up and sort of ask the audience whether they'd like to ask uh, you any questions. Or offer up any thoughts? I'll ask a question, but I'll all round up and say this is a quite a, very different to the, the type of stuff that I do. So it's been really interesting to hear um, all your your thoughts about it. And I <laughs> I can apologise for the boringness and practicalness of my question after your um, beautifully not 
boring and um, presentation. Um, were you ever challenged in taking that on a plane? Because obviously it's quite an unusual thing that people wouldn't uh, stop, you know, did anybody ever try and stop you? Um, no. And how, how do you explain what it is sort of thing? That's definitely, they made me open it. Um, so it's kind of a little container that you, I can take the battery and I can show them that it's a tiny, tiny piece that does X and Y and Z, uh, but never an issue. I've, I've thought what would happen if they say you can take it with you, but um, it has not been as special to me as, uh, I, I, in a way I would be disappointed, but um, no, it's not dangerous. You see, the battery is tiny and um, our phones are way more dangerous than, um, than this device. And as I said, it's all about a bit of DIY. So there's uh, components that you can see and show. Yeah. But I have been... You designed it on purpose because you knew you were going to be traveling with it or? No, no, I didn't. No, I didn't do it on purpose, but I'm glad it, I was able to open it um, and, and show. I've not, I've taken like five, um, around five times with me um, and not really, um, I've, well, I've not traveled much the last two years, but um, it's, it, it's, it's interesting to see, um, even to have it sometimes, what, what, what the same with jewelry, even to have it, I, I, I can see that connection. I can see that it reminds me of those trips that I was able to view what was inside. And um, sometimes I was thinking that maybe what if it was a digital screen inside the piece, I wasn't, I wasn't sure what I will show, what I will see during the trip. So it was a bit of element of surprise every time I'm traveling. There is a, an element of 10 images, but I wasn't sure which one will be the one that will surprise me. Um, but at the same time, I like the idea of a locket when you always have something there that will always be there. Even the battery is working or not, I know there is a, a, there is an, a personal sort of meaning to the piece itself. Excellent. I, I have a very final question, unless anybody else has got a more sensible question than what I'm about to ask. Now's your chance. Okay. Oh, oh, go on, Joanna. I haven't actually got a question, but I just I just did want to say that I thought that talk was absolutely fascinating. Um, I didn't really know what to expect. I didn't know what digital jewellery was. Um, and I just uh, I just found it really, really fascinating how you linked up these quite complex ideas of belonging and mm -hmm. home. With these little artifacts and it was very moving i just wanted to thank you for it that's all oh you're so welcome that's great if anyone's curious my question was going to be a mr ben question which is when you dressed up as an air hostess did you mm. feel like a different person i did feel like a different person but i, I was exciting at the same time uh, i do like performance i do i do like being sort of um taking risks I think that's all what design and artists again is all about. Um, and you're very right that when nobody knows what design research is, uh, whereas a lot of us know what scientific research or social scientist research is. So in my opinion, design brings that, so it's more closer to social scientist, obviously than um, scientific research, but it has the element of, we need to understand people's experiences in order to design meaningful objects but is it is a crossover between light um, ethnography if that makes sense not really in depth that then responds with design or through design mm -hmm. i think the idea of the probes of uh, using design as a way to elicit um sort of feelings and has always fascinated me so yeah the performance was um, i wrote a couple of papers around that it's uh, it's quite um it's strange, isn't it? Yeah, but it did make me feel like um, I could do that as a living. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much. That, that was a great, that was a great presentation. And um, I, I'm now going to say your name properly. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Great. Um, so next we have um, Jess. Cool. Alex, start screen sharing. Thank you. <laughs> cool. So. Um, my presentation, I don't think it'll be as fascinating as the last one, but I'm hoping it'll be uh, quite thought provoking. Um, so my uh, presentation is about how does spatial movement of younger adults into long term residential care impact their sense of identity 
Um, so that's a real long title, but I'm hoping as the presentation progresses, you'll get a sense of what I mean. Um, so just as a brief introduction to me, my name's Jess. Uh, I did an undergrad in criminology and psychology, um, finished in 2017. I then did a one year MRes in social science. Um, I did this during COVID and whilst COVID was going on, my uh, interest in care home research grew, obviously while care homes were shut. Um, so I did my dissertation on care homes during COVID. Um, what made me realise my research interest is my um, older brother is actually in a care home. And whilst COVID was going off and everything and the care homes were shut, um, it made me realise there's actually not a lot of research out there. Um, so this led me want to want to um, progress my passion in care home research further and do a PhD. So I'm currently in my first year of studies looking at younger, how younger care home residents make sense of their home. So enough about me. <laughs> um, so first, I don't, you don't have to shout out or say any answers, but I'd just like to um, get you thinking. So you could think of a person, it could be in real life or it could be imaginary who's living in a care home and think of the first image that comes into your head. Um, you don't have to shout out your answers. But I'd just like to get everybody thinking. So if you've got that image, then I'd like to discuss what my research is aiming to the gap in knowledge what my research is aiming to fill. It's that quite often a lot of people focus on older adults living in care homes, but there's actually a population of younger residents living in care homes. Um, so only 4% of the total population are younger, so they're very, very small. But the, uh, there is a population of people aged 30, uh, 18 to 64 living in care homes. Um, they could be living there because of physical or learning disabilities or mental health issues. Um, the reason why I asked you to think of a person in a care home previously is because I'd imagine a lot of people think of people who are elderly. Um, and quite rightly so with how many people there are living in care homes. But yeah, this is the what, gap I want my research to fill um, surrounding younger adults. Um, so younger adults are massively under research within academic literature and debates. Um, and I tried thinking in my head why this might be. So first reason is probably quite obvious because the small population is quite smaller compared to older people. Um, people obviously, there's more pressing need to research older adults. Um, there's also a lot of illnesses related to older age, such as dementia, which requires a lot more pressing need for research um, because of obviously the complex implications of that, etc. The second reason why um, can be related to stereotypes of ageing, um, what society place on care home residents. So people see care homes as an end of life trajectory, old folks home, kind of like a terminal place where people go to live out the rest of their life at a later age. My argument is that younger adult residents need more research attention because their experiences may differ greatly to older people. Also, from a policy perspective, younger people's needs and experiences aren't often taken into account. Younger people are a lot less likely to fund their own care. Um, and so the policy debates surrounding like selling your home to afford care for older people aren't often relevant to younger people. So there's lots of different implications as to why younger adults need more research attention. Anyway, getting on to the main bulk of my presentation in surrounding identity change upon relocation to a care home. So moving into residential care requires an adjustment to an environment difference one's previous lifestyle. I've um, popped the image on the right of packing tape and moving boxes because there is the physical transition of a person into a care home. And like any other change, it can influence their identity. So age makes affect experiences of the transition to care. On one side, I've got younger residents. On the other side, I've got older. So for younger residents, from an age perspective, they might experience a mismatch between chronological age and age category, where they're making a life as opposed to making a living associated with people who are at working age. So younger people might be... Um, expected to get the first house get a career start a family that sort of stuff but for younger people who enter a care home quite often they don't experience them kind of things and as as a result they may struggle to make sense of their residence whereas on the other hand 
older people seem to be conforming with this culturally appropriate script for their age. This leads to them tending to be more accepting. So there's three phases, what they might go through. Feeling overwhelmed with their initial new place of settlement, adjusting to it, and then finally accepting. But nevertheless, whether older people are more accepting of the change of environment than younger people, any transition is associated with uncertainty and stress, regardless of whether it's welcomed or not. So if you think of any transition from one place to another, one major, major popular thing that I think of is moving house. There's going to be uncertainty and stress there, even if you want to move house. It's, it's essentially the same for care home residents who move from one place to another. They're packing up all the things, they're moving to a new environment. So there's always going to be uncertainty and stress. Young people entering a care home are confronted with a range of distinct personal dilemmas. They might lose their identity. So I've had a look at the existing literature surrounding this and there's been some really negative like words coming out, trapped, depressed homelessness, confinement, um, and the literature out there pretty much says that identity ch changing location can really negatively affect young people's identity, emptiness, disempowerment. Um, but a lot of studies don't really take into account how the person ends up transitioning to long-term care. So on one, one hand, the younger adult might have been born with a disability and had support networks in place since birth. So they might have lived in the family home and still had the presence of carers, people coming in, supporting them, looking after them. As a result, they might be more accepting of the transition into long-term care and their identity might not change as much. Whereas on the other hand, Younger adults may have had a usual life. I say usual in quotation marks because it's not really sure what is usual, um, but nevertheless might have experienced an accident or an illness resulting in needing immediate support in place. Um, so there'll be a shift in identity from homemaker to a dependent disabled person. Um, and I think that can really impact an identity a lot more than people who have um, received support since birth. Um, this is something I wanted to explore further in my PhD as well. Um, so one thing I would like to point out though is that not all experiences of younger people's relocation into a care home results in negative identity changes. So whilst the existing literature might be really negative, there's also literature that says that the people can rebuild their identity upon entering a care home reconstruct the sense of home and they might gain that sense of recognition that they move into an accommodation that's more appropriate for their needs they might get better support systems there's people there's things in place such as therapy rooms they might also realize that they're surrounded by other people who are similar to them and be able to form a connectedness and relationships within that a sense of where I belong sort of thing so a lot of literature surrounding care homes and making sense of home um, talks about ma ma maintaining identity through meaning. Um, and this is through material culture. So bringing in personal belongings that they might have had with them all their life personalises their environment and maintains sense of recognition and familiarity. And this really strengthens their identity because they've got something that they can associate with their previous life prior to living in the home because it can evoke memories and emotions. And this is an ongoing process um, which takes place through interactions between the resident and the person. Secondly, maintaining identity through familiarity, and this can be done through relationships, maintaining familiar relationships and familiar faces. Um, so, Care homes should increase opportunities for participating within the community and encourage interpersonal relationships within the home through re with residents and staff. Um, and Barbara tells us that this enables a positive sense of identity. Also involvement of people from the previous life outside of the home, such as family and friends. Um, obviously, this was a lot harder during COVID when visit visitors weren't allowed. Um, so it'd be interesting to see what that'd be like now, well, obviously during COVID. 
Um, and this is because there's many unfamiliar faces in and around the home. So there might be other residents, family coming to visit, there might be workers, new staff, um, et cetera. So having unfamiliar faces and then having the familiar faces that people already know can uh, uphold the positive sense of identity. So as a result, existing literature demonstrate, demonstrates that identity change can be influenced by lots of factors, such as age, whether older or younger, under what circumstances the resident entered the home, whether they, whether they needed it immediately or it's been on, they've had ongoing support throughout the life. Resident perceptions on how necessary they, necessary they feel their environment is. Relationships in and around the home with staff and other residents and family and also material culture. Um, it is really important to note though that not all experiences are the same and every resident will experience change in a different way. Um, home is individually defined. Um, how this links to my uh, wider PhD research. So my main research question for my PhD is how do younger adult care home residents aged 18 to 35 make sense of home? Initially, it was 18 to 64, but I realised that's such a wide age span that people who are 64 will probably experience living in a care home different to someone who's 19, 20. So I wanted to focus on the younger adults age group rather than the younger, older group older adults age group if that makes sense I am I'm only in my first year so I haven't conducted any research yet but I'm hoping to use qualitative methods particularly creative methods to capture what residents feel makes their environment home so what I'd really like to do is use some sort of um, camera um, technology and get the resident to walk around with a camera if they're capable of doing so or go along and video with them and get them to either tell me or point to me or that sort of thing what they feel is like makes their home and obviously go from there um, because I think it's really important for people to show what makes the home if you think back to the uh, material culture slide the possessions and belongings can make up a big sense of what residents feel is home um, so that'd be really interesting. I'm wanting to conduct field work with fam family members, staff, residents and their friends. And I'm hoping to do it with two to three homes, but I'll conduct a more in-depth case study with one home if I'm struggling with access. Access to care homes for research can be really difficult. And I struggled with this during my MRes. Um, I don't think COVID helped because of the pandemic, care homes were shut down pretty much anyway. But... It, um, it, it's really difficult to gain access for research. So I'm hoping I'll get two to three homes, but I'd be happy to do an in-depth case study with one if um, that, that's not happening. Yeah, so I think I've really whizzed through that. <laughs> I don't think that was 20 minutes at all, but um, I've got references and I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has at all. And there's just my email there if anyone wants to uh, ask any more questions. Thank you. Well, well done, Jess. And I don't think any of us would have guessed that, that was your first presentation. So, um, so congratulations. Um, one of the uh, very pleasant things for me as the sort of hub point of this space and place group is that I get to see various um, things that shouldn't connect up, but actually do connect up if you think about them in the right way. Um, and as you were talking, I was thinking about presentations that I've enjoyably sat through over the years in this group forum on um, prison ethnography, um, you know, the research of the experience of being in prison and how you go about, you know, getting some insight qualitatively into that. Um, and then also reminded of two researchers within CRESA, who you may or may not know of, and forgive me, I can't actually remember one of them's names, so apologies to them when they realise, if they ever realise by watching this video, that I couldn't remember their name. Um, but we had um, a session on, oh, it was part of our Haunted um, series, actually, uh, and we, we did a sort of Haunted Home sort of uh, uh, session. And we had a speaker from CRESA who was talking about women's shelters and the way in which women acclimatized to arriving in the shelters and they had been using um, visual methods uh, which mm -hmm. I, you, you mentioned you mentioned there so might be worth hooking up with a person whose name I've forgotten but I'm I sure think, I think I know who it is 
it, I don't know if uh, to say it if because it's going on YouTube. Don't she, is it Lindsay? I think it is. Yeah. Yeah, she's my supervisor. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Well, this is quite a small world, but all right. But the other one, <laughs> yeah, you may say right. she's also part of the supervisory team, also in Creza is um, Amy, who's done work on energy ethnographies of the home. So trying to get people to talk about how they dwell within their houses from a point of view of how they interact with energy use. So there's quite a lot of experience, you know, around in the social science part of uh, uh, the institution um, on trying to drill into, you know, how can you use creative methods, in particular visual methods, to try and get a user type perspective on, on the kind of things that you're looking for. So I think that's really, that's really interesting and promising. Um, yeah. The other thing that occurred to me, and I'll, I'll open it up for, for, for observations and questions in a moment, the other thing that occurred to me is you framed it, you know, very appropriately, as though the people you're going to research are the, I don't know what the polite, appropriate discretion is, care dwellers, is that, I don't know, um, you, you know who I'm talking about. Residents. Residents, that's it. Yeah. I just wonder whether there's also scope to look at, and I agree access to this could be difficult, but um, look at how the, the care home operator thinks of that sort of onboarding, welcoming in process. How do they think that people acclimatise and how do their systems assume that acclimatisation operates? And what's the fit between their assumption of how people should be welcomed and acclimatised? How does that fit with the actual lived reality of people, you know, finding that helpful or not helpful and some people having different needs and so on and so forth? So um, you might want to just think about that angle uh, maybe uh, as well. Um, Colleagues, any other comments or questions for Jess? Yeah, I've got a question, if that's okay. okay. Yeah. Um, it, it was a really interesting presentation and, and I think your PhD sounds, I, I, hope, I hope I'll hear some more um, as you go on with your research. And I'm quite interested in the experience of boarding school, which is also very under-researched, particularly um, for women. And obviously people who go to boarding school, they're a bit younger than the age group you're looking at. But I think a big factor is, um, whether they want to go or not um, is often isn't taken into account. And I, I appreciate that the people that you're working with, they, they have um, a, a clear need for more, perhaps more care than they can get outside of residential care. But do you deal at all with whether people are reluctant to leave their um, life they've had before and move into care home? Is there a lot of resistance? I'm not too sure because I haven't actually conducted research yet, but that's something I'd definitely like to look into. Mm -hmm. um, whether how they actually feel about the transition themselves, um, whether it whether they're obviously like accepting over the that they're going to get the like help and support they need, or they're resistant, they want to stay with the family home. Because mm -hmm. I'd imagine that can be quite similar with boarding schools. Obviously, children might not be wanting to go. So yeah, it's a really interesting like concept that I'd, I'd, I'd definitely want to look into further. I'm hoping that I'd get some information out of that from possibly like the residents' families. Um, oh, right, okay. Yeah, yeah when, I, when I interview the families, obviously say like, how did you, how was it like a mutual agreement to make the transition um because obviously some residents can lack capacity to make the decision you know like say if they're really severely disabled sort of thing and um, so it's obviously how do families deal with making that yeah yeah that, that would be really interesting yeah yeah thank you Luke, yeah yeah yeah, uh, yeah so in adding up to what uh, is it by the way, you did a very good presentation, Jess. Uh, so adding up to what uh, Joanna said, my uncle is looking into, I don't know for want of expression, maybe I'll be wrong here, but your research is looking into care homes. So how does the experience in terms of uh, the younger residents of people that are being, you know, the service are being delivered in their home. So now that, that will be the, the reverse of it that would be home care so oh, yeah. is is there any kind of that kind of similarities or any differences that will be provided if someone is in in a care home or in this case the person is in their home and you are providing the services 
how is those identities is going to change? Is this something that you are looking into? Because I think it would have been a very good. Um, yeah. Kind of yeah, well, I've read quite a bit on it, home care and sense of home, and it actually says that people can get more of a familiar sense of home if they're receiving care in their like, own home, um, because they've got all their, they've got everything there, um, the possessions, everything. Obviously, people can take their possessions into their care home, but they can't take absolutely everything. They can't like lay the room out exactly how it is in their home. Um, but on the other hand, I've read that home care can actually be quite intrusive and disruptive because the staff have to come in and like make adjustments to the home. So they might need to change the shower to make it accessible. Um, and there can be that sense of kind of like alienation. A lot of um, staff as well who provide home care can be, um, I can't remember what it's called, where there's, it, there's quite a high rotation of staff. So they might not get they might not get the same care like every day and every time, um, and also when it's home care they're um, very restricted on how long they can spend with the person in the home, so they might only get like a twenty minute visit. So they might not get chance to possibly like sit with them and have a cup of tea or chat with them. They might just have to get like the personal care jobs done and then move on to the next job. So there's a lot of like pros and cons of home care in comparison to like care homes. Um, obviously the person's still in the like home environment, but they're getting, they might be getting strangers into the home. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Yeah, interesting, interesting idea there. Um, any, any, any other observations or we'll, uh, move on? Just going to say something quickly, if you don't mind, I'm, I should hold my hand up and say I'm one of Jess's supervisors as well. So, um, <laughs> this is slightly biased. Uh, we've had lots of previous discussions about this. Um, but I, one of the things that I'm really, I'm really interested in all of Jess's project, but one of the things, uh, was something related to what you just raised, Joanna, about, um, this idea of the amount of choice that people have in relation to how much they're going into care and um you know into a care home and there's you know there are there's lots of balances of needs in relation to um the young person themselves and their ability to make a decision but if if somebody is staying at home and has a high level of care need a lot of you know there can be a lot of assumptions around what a family will provide and it may get to the point where a family can't provide it and then end up the choice possibly being taken away from the the person so a lot of the time maybe they're not making that choice in a way that a lot of the rest of us might make a choice to move home and I think that that really does I think you're right that really does affect how people are going to feel about um homes as well but the other thing that struck me um was just that about some of the really similar things that you both presenters said you know about this kind of moving between spaces and, and sort of where is where is home when you're kind of moving between obviously this is perhaps more of a, a permanent move um maybe um but you know one that you're not going backwards and forwards as much but just i, I love these these sessions and the way of all these really interestingly different things feel like they're suddenly connected so thank you great can i just uh, jump yeah, in to say that if uh, jessica i mean i have a lot of experience around design probes and designing objects that can open questions and sometimes it's really difficult to ask a question openly but an object can do it can do this for you i'm more than happy to um well um talk to you more about it's a it's a big space and there's a lot of work um within design which i think is quite um not known but there's a lot of work around design probes cultural probes um, and then again, there's a, as, um, as you both said, I think there's a lot of similarities around the topics because what what strikes me is we're saying home is individual individually defined, but there's something that is very dynamic and it's not always the same. So I think there is something really important to keep in mind. It's not fixed. It's not home. It's not the home you left. It's always your home. Mm. Um, there is the feeling. Is the safety. Is the familiarity that I think is more intangible and again it's really interesting and I always uh, I think in social scientists you have such an in-depth understanding of the context that fascinates me um so I'm, I'm if you if, if uh, well both of you um I know your supervisor here but I would be more than happy to uh, show you design designerly ways of uh, of exploring 
context yeah yeah definitely so what what do you mean by like design probes like the um it's object is actually as you said with a camera or with the when you ask people to document their environment it's one way yeah um and then that could be through um so the idea of cultural probes which was in 1999 within design context it was when uh, they were sending sort of a kit with maps, with a disposable camera, with a diary. So for um, the aging population to, ex to understand what it means to be an elderly person. But then since then, 30 years later, there's a lot of projects around um, probes and using objects. Because you cannot ask easily a person, are you forced to come here? Are you happy here? Is it, is it easy for you to move all your stuff from one place to the other? Was the transition easy for you? You cannot really open that question, but an object that has um, openings for conversations, it could be like the compass I've sent, uh, what I've designed, it could be, where is home? This yeah, compass yeah. points home. And then that person would actually say, I don't know where that compass points. Yeah. You know, it's, or I do know is a fixed location or and then you open up discussions around home in different ways um so this what design probes I guess give as a method yeah yeah that's really interesting definitely because I was using create I was hoping to use creative methods purely because some of the residents who I might be talking to mm -hmm. might have different complex needs so they might have learning disabilities or physical disabilities where they struggle to speak or like have conversations mm -hmm. so that I'd definitely be able to like facilitate conversations by like physically having something or physically making something as or a response to yeah. Um, another project that with again during my PhD I was drawing lived experiences so I was making a sketch and then I've asked my participants that, to continue the drawing and then I was continuing back and then they're continuing back so we had a conversation which I call dialogical sketching yeah. um so there is I know this could not be always the case again if somebody's not creative but quite often people are happy to draw to paint um, so it's getting to know who is your participants, I think, is, um, is one thing, but it's again, it's quite a big, a, a broad area and a big part of my PhD was around that and my supervisor was one of the pioneers, so I kind of feel that it's, a, it's an area that if I would be happy to share, um, if that would help, you know. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. That's that's really interesting. Definitely. I'd love to like learn more about that. That'd be great. Lovely. Well, thanks. Thanks for that. One really nice to have that sort of interaction this evening with people, you know, generously uh, contributing and offering. It's 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 a positive function of a, a more intimate number of people on this particular event. So we'll celebrate the positives where we find them. Um, I'm now going to stop the recording because we, we, we've agreed not to record Joanna's presentation so I'm just going to uh, elaborate that in order that it makes sense for the end of the recording <laughs> even though it'll seem like I'm wrapping things up I'm, I'm simply saying to the person who's watching this recording we're now stopping the event is carrying on uh, but we're not recording the final presenter so thank you for thank you for watching this recording